Let's see the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Many thanks for staying with us. We will be joined by Tunde Kolawale. He's a legal practitioner as we make sense of the headlines this morning. Tunde, thank you for joining us. Good morning, Thanks for having me. All right, then. Good. Let, let, let's quickly take a look at the leadership newspaper this morning and see what uh, the leadership talks about. Our stand, security alerts by the United States Embassy, who gains more like an editorial, and you find PMB shocks finance minister and backs a mayfully on Naya redesign. Uh, a lot of people, I can't wait to share your thoughts, uh, Tunde Kolawale, on this one, because uh, we have some persons who are saying there seemed to be a disconnect even in the system of governance. You have a minister who was appointed by, you know, uh, the president himself, and, and it feels like the president, the minister, the central bank of Nigeria, to not in sync. Away from that, 2023, Fanny Ferrer backtracks and endorses Tunubu. I remember the conversation that we had, particularly I had, you know, on this platform where we had one of the stakeholders of the Fanny Ferrer speaking with us, saying they have an endorsed Peter Obi. And my big question was, does that represent the interest of the entire Southwest? But this is what it is. 60 killed in Indian bridge collapse from a uh, vice president. Uh, I beg your pardon. Vice President Yemi Oshibanjo, ex Colombian President, AFDB, uh, lead new job creation effort. Uh, that's also what the leadership captions it this morning, and that's it. On the leadership, we quickly turn our attention to the punch. On the punch, CBN destroys over six trillion banknotes under Buhari. Very bold. We have several riders. Apex Bank spends 3.88 billion naira to dispose mutilated banknotes in five years. Naira slums to 785 per dollars reserves deep. Local currency faces more pressure. I mean, that's what I talked about. 85. You had some persons were saying 85. All the quarters were saying 800. President defends. Uh, MFLE as criticism mounts against Naira uh, redesign. The riders you find underneath uh, the caption. Lagos Ibadan Express student fund raise ransom, kidnap mates released. Buhari to meet security chiefs, postpone event. Soldiers killed terrorists in Kaduna, terror bombings. Somali to fly critical injured victims abroad, and death toll now 104. Countries condemn attack at Buhari. Pope orders more 161 soul stampede victims. Very unfortunate incident. Deban joins Sistan Obi as uh, you have the FNF ferry backs at Tunubu. Very interesting. Moving away from that, oil earnings crashed by 288 billion naira in the third quarter. That's what the federal government is saying. Bruno housewife poisons chief imam says, I hate marriage. Or really bad. And Senate probes AGF Malamis ministry over 2.2 billion hour expenditure. That's so much we can take this morning on uh, the Punch newspaper. Away from the Punch, we have uh, the Daily Trust. CBN has my backing for redesigning Naira notes. President Mohamed Buhari is quoted to say. Says currency will benefit from initiative. Uh, people with illicit money buried under the soil will have to will have a challenge. A president comment puts the Mefili and finance ministers rift to rest. <laughs> and uh, just before we move away from that, this might just be dominating all of the papers. The uh, social political group uh, talking about the Afenifer leaders and uh, making the others endorsing Bola Tunubu, former Lagos State Governor, who's the flag bearer of the APC. All firms pay 138 billion hour petroleum tax. And terror alert, Buhari holds emergency security meeting today. Uh, we have we've had several of this. Nigeria's Flamingos edge Germany for the first ever World Cup medal. Well, this is really brilliant. We just hope that the girls would have, you know, be on top of it. But they were very fantastic and we must really celebrate them. Ganduje launches mass transit scheme with 100 bosses and 50 taxes. Abuja rail to resume operations soon as minister meets contractors.
these some of the headlines you find on the Daily Trust and uh, just uh, the, the Daily Sun before we have Tunde Kolawale join the conversation this morning. Abuja resident leave in fear and tight security. It reminds me of a conversation <laughs> with, you know, some people who are leaving in fear, but not necessarily because a lot of orders in Abuja seem to be going about their businesses and having a great time. Worship centers record low attendance. Government stops Abuja vigilantes from bearing arms or firearms riders underneath the uh, caption. And uh, South East governors raises alarm over insecurity, seeks federal government intervention. Joint security team to patrol zone wants political solution to Kanu. And uh, you find Tunubu, Atiku, or B others asked to publish source of campaign funding. Wiki coalition dare are you to stop or tom others. 2023, Atiku more grounded in grassroots politics than Tunubu PDP national youth leader. Uh, is quoted to say, Vice President Yemo Sibajo, ex-Colombian President AFDB, lead new job creation efforts in Africa. Ohaneze backs Akira Dolu on Amotekun, urges Oshun governor-elect to include Igbo in government. Lagos transporters begin seven-day strike today, uh, say no going back. It's going to be a lot. Nigeria defeats Germany to claim the bronze uh, in under-17 Women's World Cup. Congratulations to the Flamingos and congratulations to Nigeria. Well, that's it this morning. Tunde Kolawale, thank you so much for joining us. Let's uh, have you share yeah, your thoughts you. now. Uh, so I'll leave it very open to you uh, because the headlines are really interesting. I'd like to share your thoughts. Which of them caught your interest as we went through the pages this morning? Well, maybe the first one I would like to comment on well, about is uh, the redesign of uh, of uh, the Naira, uh, which is causing a lot of rumpus all over the country. The Minister of Finance has come out openly against the wisdom and humble opinion to say that she was not consulted before the CBM proceeded to uh, redesign uh, the Naira. The president, like you have also read and said, look, the governor of the CBN has my backing in the processes of uh, redesigning the, the Naira. And of course, the CBN too has been defending the actions that they have uh, taken in redesigning um, uh, the Naira. But the truth of the matter is that uh, when you look at the, the law, the CBN Establishment Act, it gives uh, the CBN a lot of powers to manage the monetary processes, the monetary um, the activities of the country, either in terms of production, either in terms of curtailing inflation, either in terms of ensuring that the Naira is not abused, either in terms of frustrating those who hold the Naira or those who um, um, carry out illegal activities uh, with it. But the question you want to ask yourself is, uh, is it good wisdom when you want to redesign the Naira that you will not carry the means of finance? who also has a role to play in some of these issues that you have talked about. Or let's say, for example, a place like Britain. Can the Prime Minister of Britain and then uh, maybe the governor of uh, Cheka, I mean, the, the CBN governor, carry out uh, the designation of uh, the past talent without carrying the chancellor of Cheka around, coming along? The answer is no. If you want to design the Naira, you don't want it um, uh, to leak out. So as to be able to achieve whatever results you want to achieve, that is to mop up or make sure or render useless all the excesses uh, money or naira in the pockets of people in the terms of their homes or under the grants that they might have buried their daughter. All you needed to do is to hold a top secret meeting with all the relevant people who ought to know before you carry this out. And so the kind of contradiction, the kind of uh, debate the kind of conflict that we are having between government officials will not be there. And when you also look at um, the CBN establishment now, before you think out with the Naira or with any money for that matter, the public ought to be carried along. You have to educate them on the reason why you are doing it. You also have to educate them on the improvement that you are bringing into the Naira. You also have to educate them on why you are taking the action. Because of people have legitimately earned their money and for reasons best known to them, they may not be keeping in the CBA. 
You don't design the Nala and allow such legitimately earn money to turn to dust, to turn to waste, to turn to ordinary paper in their hands. And if you ask yourself, how many times of countries in the world go about the design of their currency? The five sterling has been there for so long, the dollar has been there for so long, they only create more money or maybe improve the polymer text of it to make it more durable. But here, the Naira, our currency, is used as a political instrument, which is not too good for us. And remember, we have done this before. When President Buhari was head of state, in an attempt to force the politicians who have stopped a lot of cash at home, he woke up overnight and changed the Naira. But he didn't have the effect he had intended. No! Most people who get this lost money, who uh, have a lot of good funds in their disposal, don't keep them in Naira because they know the Naira is not stable. This has been passed and this has been the dollar. So immediately they steal the money or they get some the money from illicit sources like drugs and other. They change it to the dollar and keep it in dollar or in pound or in euro because they know those currencies are stable. Sometimes they are never changed for 10, 20, 30 years and what are them? So when the first title has been dead of it, it does not work. So what gives President Buhari the impression that it goes to work this time around? What determines the set of a nation's currency is economic productivity. Secondly, um, your political class in the international community. And then uh, maybe thirdly, the prudence that to bring into all of these things are not that. For us, what are we producing in the country today? Nothing. It is a rental economy in which you just take rent from petroleum uh, uh, products and then begin to solve it, to, to, to spend it. And no and behold to that petroleum product that we rely on is no longer doing well as it used to do. Even when Russia and Ukraine are fighting, another country of the world are making way for us from the sales of petroleum products, from the sales of gas. Nigeria is the opposite and defects of what is happening in the world market. I mean, I would say with all emphasis that the just will design the Naira without carrying people and long, and for whatever purposes they say they want, they are redesigning it, that it should be difficult, for example, for bandits and all that uh, to, to, to begin to, 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 to get the kind of money that they are getting. When you and I do know that when the bandits even get the dollar, they take it to the black market and change it to dollar. Because most of the fund, most of the spending that they do in buying arms and ammunition and all that, I mean, to which they attack uh, uh, the state is uh, procured in dollars. So, so honestly so, so, speaking, this so, is not well thought out at all. It's also not to have been done at this quicker period of time. Six or seven months to hand over the new government. They should have allowed the new government to take over from them to do whatever it wants to do with the Naira. So, so um, Tunde Kola Wale, you are saying that we are going to witness, you know, the demand, more demand for the dollar. Uh, with the decision of the CBN to redesign. It, that's what you're saying? Absolutely. I think we're going to have it. There's going to be a lot of more pressure on the dollar because whoever has money now will quickly go to the black market and start looking for ways I mean, to change it to, 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 to dollar past any or euro or some of the other qualities that are more stable. All right, let's move away from that. Uh, look at the Punch newspaper this morning. And uh, it's, this same caption is dominating all of the papers. It talks about the Afeni Ferry. Uh, prior to now, we also remember that the Afeni Ferry said they were endorsing uh, the candidacy of Peter Obi. Now there seem to be, you know, a backtrack on that particular statement where they're endorsing. And this was not just a hearsay. They were... Uh, you know, you could see videos and pictures to that particular effect, endorsing uh, the person or the candidacy of Bola Matunibu. Your thoughts entirely on this? Uh, let me say this without uh, equivocation. The Afeni Ferry that we know, or that we knew, between 1979 and 19, I mean, between 19, um, 1993 and uh, uh, the year 2019 is different from the Afeni Ferry that we do have to pay. And the tragedy of it all, um, we know what has gone on with the Afeni Ferry. You will remember that the Afeni Ferry people were instrumental in ensuring or in making sure that uh, Ashwaja Ahmed became the governor of Lagos State. From the information that we got, 
when they first conducted the primary, I mean, when primary was conducted, between Nasua Di Tinobu and then the late uh, Fungshaw Williams and all that, it was the uh, late Williams um, that won that um, uh, primary. And uh, what we had that was done is that uh, the were conducted, it was agreed that wherever uh, there is a crisis in any polling station, in any polling books, or anywhere where um, the primaries are carried out, as you have to select the flag there of the AP, the election in those places are going to be carried. So somebody sponsored um, a crisis and fight in the stronghold of um, of um, uh, Fulisha Williams. And so when the elections were collated, somebody raised the issue that there were fights here, there were fights in these other places where Fulisha Williams uh, were at the stronghold. And because of that, the reports in those places were cancelled. At the end of the day, as well as what I met, you know, we might as um, the flag bearer of the AP when we returned to Siburu. And uh, immediately it became uh, the governor. One of the first things he did was to really wreck the Afeniferi people. He polarized them, he divided them. In fact, at the time, there were two Afeniferi or three Afeniferi in the country, I mean, in the Valley. There was the new Afeniferi, there was the original Afeniferi, and there were some other splinter groups. Uh, who are also calling themselves Afenifeli as Laura. The truth of the matter is that uh, Afenifeli has been polarized. And Nashi Waidu could be said to have a hand, so it has led to have a hand in the polarization of that uh, institution, simply because he wants to dominate the class. He doesn't want a situation in which any institution, any individual, will be able to dictate to him or influence the course of action he wants to take or even impose their wish and caprice on him. Sometimes he is a dominant personality. He may not be a team player when it comes to the issues of his uh, personal entry. So, if there are different factions of Afghanistan Imperial and does it in Ubu today, it should not be uh, something straight to it could be a continuation of the polarization strategy of uh, Ashwa Dibola and Tinubu. More importantly, too, you and I will know that Power Fasolati, who used to be the leader of the Afghanistan Imperial, the man who is based in the United States. Uh, at the time, said, look, uh, they are very, very that he's seen that people were not listening to him. People were doing just what they like. And then he resigned. And that is when uh, Olani Wajai, Paolani Wajai, stepped in as an interim leader. And he has been piloting the affairs of um, of uh, Afeni Ferry um, uh, up to today. Maybe because the man has now endorsed uh, Peter Upi and he supported Peter Upi, that is why they have gone to insurrect and some of these other splinter groups who are now saying they will be back here to the parliament in Ogo. The truth of the matter is that the Yoruba people that I know, those of them, I mean, they are very, very, they really are very, very people that I know. They are men of integrity. Whatever decision they are taking, except they are the superior argument, they are never likely to change their position. What you are seeing with the very, very endorsing and actually or endorsing this OB are not the complete you are seeing today. It's man made. Somebody is engineering it with the view to polarizing that organization so but, that but, somebody somewhere will cross there. Mm. But Tunde Kola Wale. All right, yeah. uh, Tunde, but would, you, would it be okay to say that? Uh, I mean, if it's anything to go by what you've said, that uh, there seems to be an upper hand, there's a force that's actually influencing the decision that we have seen, the backtrack even though it feels like not everyone in the Fenifer is in support of endorsing, uh, you know, Bola Matunibu's candidacy for presidency in 2023. But l let's even say that's anything to go by. Let's even, you know, take that away. But do you think that the Fenifer, if the Fenifer is saying, hey, we're endorsing a certain candidate, does that reflect the interests of the people in the region? Would it mean that everyone who's of the Yoruba extraction would definitely, you know, be following the, the words of the Fenifer? No, no, it's not possible. I am a Yoruba man, and I am not in Afeniferi, and whatever candidate that they endorse, I'm not likely to vote for that person. In fact, I would say that the Afeniferi, to me, today, is only strong on paper. They are a paper tiger. The, some of them cannot even dictate to their households. The people within the household, the people that they feed, the people that they provide accommodation for, they cannot dictate to them who those persons are going to vote for. They are a relic of the past. Yeah, so, uh, 
most Yoruba people will not follow their family family. If the Yoruba people have been following their family family in the recent past and all that, some of the clans who are now leaders in Yoruba land will not be there. They just make these pronouncements and all that. The persuasive authority that we used to have over the people went away or left them a uh, long ago. So, but for symbolic purposes and what happened, and then maybe for the old Arabs, for the old, 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 old people of the Awuno extraction who are still alive, whatever they are very, very, they might be, they might have told the lie, but the majority and the bulk of the Yoruba people will, I have my doubt, that they will ever enforce or endorse or follow Afeni Feli to whatever political party that they go. If the Afeni Feli themselves could have a nation in this country today, like I like the Ghanaian without one contested at all, he failed woefully. He, he couldn't win any, uh, even in his own uh, uh, world. So, uh, Afeni Feli for me, it's a paper tiger that nobody should uh, worry about. All right, let's, uh, let's quickly talk about the insecurity. The president will be having an emergency meeting, uh, you know, today with uh, security chiefs and stakeholders uh, to, you know, respond to all of the security threats. Recently, it's the issue of the kidnapping on Lagos Ibadan uh, Way, highway, if you like to say, and the different persons have raised concern, really. Where are we headed? What exactly is going on? Why are we still talking about all of this, especially when we know that the Buhari's government was strong, very strong on, you know, solving the security challenges of the country? Hmm. Let's see. Look, you don't need to be a soothsayer to know why we are facing these security challenges. First and foremost, I've postulated this argument before, and I will continue to postulate it. Nigeria is supposed to be a secular state and not a theocratic state. Immediately, a section of the country said they were going to adopt theocracy. That is the Sharia system of governance in, uh, in managing the affairs of the Nigerian state and all that. We've created 50% of problems for ourselves in that area. Because immediately you made that announcement, all the Islamic fundamentalists in the Maghreb, in the Sahel, and then uh, when uh, Libya collapsed, all of them migrated to Nigeria and began to see Nigeria as a fertile ground where they could push their agenda to have a theocratic state in West Africa from where they would find out to the other West African states and other and turn the whole of the West Africa into a theocratic state. So the Islamic fundamentalism, the theocracy, the Sharia, that the northern part of the country said they want to impose on the rest of the country is one of the reasons why we are having this security challenge. The second one is this. When you look all over the world today, there is provision of arms everywhere. Arms which should be very, very difficult to acquire. It's now flying all over the place. You go over the sea, you go into the Atlantic Ocean and all that. There are ships who are battle who are in there, who are disposed, who are selling out and ammunition to all manner of people. With the security people who have little or no control um, uh, over. Take, for example, the Niger Delta area. Look at all the militant groups in the Niger Delta area. All of them are carrying arms and ammunition. All the bandits in the north are carrying arms and ammunition. It has also been alleged that some IPOP members are also carrying arms and ammunition. Ah, they get it is arms and ammunition. The arms and ammunition are all not to be in people's hands. And everywhere, once you have your money, you could easily get it. The second one is that uh, we have been told we have unemployment that is 33 percent high. 33% unemployment is a recipe for disaster. So when people are not employed, when they don't have a means of living with another, they will talk to crime and criminality to be able to feed themselves, no matter what the consequences they might be. Some would say, well, is it not better that I perish in the process of looking for means of my livelihood than to sit back in the comfort of my home and be killed by, 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 by hunger? Look at some of our children who are traveling abroad through the Atlantic Ocean, through the Mediterranean Sea, how they are dying, how they are perishing. And as they are dying in the Mediterranean and the Atlantic Ocean and all that, more and more people are still taking the risk to go to those places. And when you ask those children, why are you people taking this risk? And are you sure you are going to be accommodated in the country that you are migrating to? And the children will easily tell you, and say, look, it is better for me to be a cleaner in a place like America or in the U.S. than to be an engineer or a banker in Nigeria. Some of them will say they will prefer that the fishes in the Atlantic Ocean should eat there 
when they are both or whatever thing, this thing they are traveling with, in the fact they capsizing, that it's better for the fishes to eat them than for them to waste in Nigeria and die of hunger. So, lack of uh, food security is a recipe for the crisis or for the insecurity that we have uh, in the country. Furthermore, our politicians are fueling insecurity. Which field of politicians can you point out in Nigeria today that does not have a private army that backs them, that makes sure that um, they deploy in the process of winning the election? And there are more these so called private security people. I mean, these are so called private army. And what happened? And the DSS, the police, and all that, and even the president himself, do you know that most of the frontline politicians have their private army? With which they push their electoral process or their electoral ambition without anybody being able to do about it. Look at what is happening in part of the country. Peter Obi and Paul went to Nasarawa State. They wanted to contest. The, the stadium was shot against him. Uh, the PDP, I think, went to Ezekiel like Kaduna or Kano to contest. They were attacked with all manners of uh, weapons. Where are those weapons coming from? The CCTV camera carried but, but most of these attacks. Kala Wale, uh, uh, Tunde. Yeah. Today, if this is what it is, so we seem to have, uh, like you have rightly mentioned, that the, the arms in the hands of non-state actors. And how, how come exactly. non-state actors are becoming more powerful than, you know, the entire nation? You have uh, a security architecture. You have different forces, the Nigerian police. So, I mean, how come we're at this point where, you know, this non-state actors have empowered the security architecture of the country? Is it that we don't have what it takes to tackle them? in terms of, you know, oh, the manpower, have, the resources? Have. What exactly, then, is the issue? Well, we have. You see, I, because of the nature of my job, I interact a lot with the police, I interact with the army, I've also had the opportunity to interact with the DSS and Google. There are so many intelligent people and capable people in most of these places. What is happening is a political way. And that lack of political will began even before President Mohamed Bouhari become and uh, the president, you will remember when Dr. Kula Jamaica tried to use a very strong arm, a uh, sledgehammer, against the bandits and then the Islamic fundamentalists in the North. President Buhari was one of the first persons that came out and said, Look, the attack against the bandits and the Islamic fundamentalists in the northern part of the country is an attack against the North. It is an attempt to decimate the population of the North and all that. If you are a service person, if you are a soldier, if you are a policeman, if you are a DSS person, and the person who said that kind of a person eventually becomes the president, will you be enthusiastic in pursuing uh, those bandits and Islamic fundamentalists that they have accused you of, uh, of, of a killing because you want to reduce the population of the northern part of the country? The answer is no. So the lack of political will is there. Secondly, like I said, the politicians, all of them, have the private army and because even the governor, even the president will benefit from the deployment of these private armies of the politicians in terms of winning the elections and all that. They will usually turn a blind eye to the activities of these people. That is why it has now become, it, has, it now looks like as if the new state actors are more powerful than the state. Look at the award of contract for uh, pipeline surveillance and all that. It's been awarded to individuals. I will say that the individuals in the Niger Delta are more powerful than the Navy, they are more powerful than the police, they are more powerful than the security forces. And you are worried that contract for four point something billion dollars on a monthly basis. You are putting four point something billion dollars in the hands of one individual. If a man has four point something billion dollars every month to, 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 to toy with, there is no state institution that that kind of a party cannot compromise. There is no state institution. Mm -hmm. And then it's, uh, it's security has been, it's not allowed to carry arms and ammunition in the process of securing the so-called uh, 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 pipeline. And again, do you blame the, um, the security people when they are depressed the Niger data to get the pipelines and what happens? All right. They be part of the solution. They become the part of the problem because of the prevalent um, uh, corruption that we have in the country. So it's, uh, the Nigerian problem is the hydra headed. It's a uh, CAC 25. You will need somebody with a strong will and determination political will who doesn't care on who stores his steps on to make sure that we do have security in this country. I challenge you, and I say it openly, that the security challenge in the country can be solved within six months if there is a political will to so do.
All right, thank you so much, Tunde Kolawale, for being part of the show this morning. We appreciate your time and your thoughts. We look forward to having... Uh, Thanks for having me. Yes, that's it. Do have to you too, Tunde. And that's Tunde Kolawale. He's a legal practitioner, uh, of course. We had him sharing his thoughts on the big stories this morning on Off the Press. We'll take a break and when we return, we'll be looking at the issue of kidnapping and the fact that it's on the increase in Nigeria. Please stay with us.